Biva Walnut, the Cheyenne for good morning. My name is Quentin Romanos. I'm the current president for the National Indian Education Association. I'd like to welcome you to the annual State of Indian Education Address given each year as part of the NIA Annual Legislative Summit. I'm a Cheyenne from Watonga, Oklahoma, and if you know where Watonga, Oklahoma is at, you've been in Cheyenne Rapo country. Uh, my wife and LaDonna and I have four, four grown kids. We have eight grandchildren. I'm a citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes. I just want to tell you a little bit about my family history before I get into the main part of my speech. I'm the great grandson of the Cheyenne chief, Romanos, who lived in the 1800s. As a warrior, he and other warriors from other tribes in western Oklahoma, Kiowa, Comanches, Arapahoes, they were singled out and they were taken as prisoners to Fort Marion, Florida, prisoners of war. And I say that because they were not given a trial and you were, they were sentenced. They were just saying, we think you did it. Get on the train. We're taking you to Florida. So that's basically what happened. So my great-grandfather was one of the warriors that was taken to Florida. In Florida, a, a U.S. Army captain by the name of Pratt set up a program in which they taught some of the prisoners to read and write English. And, and, I, and I think probably if you're you know, from Oklahoma, you probably know some of this history. <clears throat> At the end of the prison term, uh, many of the older warriors, the older people who were there, they went back to Oklahoma. And some of the younger warriors, including my, my grandfather, a group of about 20 of them, they went on to Fort Marion, excuse me, not Fort Marion, Hampton Institute in Virginia, which is now known as Hampton University. From there, the Congress appropriated money for Carlisle Indian School. So the group of warriors were, were really the first, you know, career tech, bow tech students for, for the Indian country. So he established a system of boarding schools, and we all know what happened. We as Native people know the long-term negative effects of boarding schools and how, what the effects it had on tribes. We know the stories. We've heard them. We know the saying, kill the Indian, save the man. We live it now with our children. I speak about the story because it was the beginning of a major federal policy on Indian education, which had absolutely no input by tribal leadership, tribal nations, no collaborations, no roundtables, no consultations. Currently, we as Native educators and tribal leaders have the opportunity to provide meaningful input in the development of current Indian education policy through the reauthorization of the ESEA, also known as NCLB. <clears throat> but let us also remember that the ones who came before us, our people, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our mothers and fathers, they stand strong beside us, and they expect us to take advantage of the opportunity to come together and build a future for the generations to come after us. What we do today, this week, this year, is another path that builds the bridges between our children's future and our ancestors' past. It is time once again for all educators to make sure that Indian education, Native education builds these bridges as well as it has always been done for thousands of years. Thank you for coming to Washington for this purpose. And because we are in Washington, it is time for me to get into the details of the vital cause. First, I want to tell you about what NIA has been doing here in Washington. Then I'll introduce the agenda for what we want to accomplish in this next year, which will be a discussion between us as educators and what the federal government shall be doing. First, I wanted to tell you a little bit some of the in about Indian education. There's approximately 700,000 American Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Native Hawaiians in the public school systems. Only about half of these Indian students graduate. You know, we talk about that all the time, and that seems to be the, the phrase that we most identify with, the dropout. But for those of us who have kids, you know, we have two kids or more, you know, how, how devastating it, it would be. And, and I know it doesn't apply to this room because probably most of our kids here are successful. But how devastating would it be if we sat here today and we knew that our children, and I have four children, if I knew that two of them were going to drop out, 
two of them were not going to graduate. So even though they're not real, related to us directly, how devastating would it be for your family? Can you imagine the, the, the situation, you know, if only half your kids dropped out or half of them succeeded? It would it, be a devastating. But yet that continues in, in the country. Of those who graduated from high school, a quarter completed a certificate or associate degree, and about a third completed a bachelor's degree within six years of enrollment. Seventy percent of the BIE, Bureau of Indian Education Schools, have failed to satisfy AYP in 2005. In the National Center for Education Statistics report, projections of education statistics to 2019, for the number of high school graduates between 2007 to 2020, there will be a decrease, a decrease by 2% for American Indians and Alaska Natives, even though the overall number of Native American students will increase during that time. And so, you know, the only other, other minority group is uh, black males. You know, it, isn't it a sad statistic? Here it is, the government has reporting this, that in the future, if we're gonna continue the way we go, that, you know, not only is our, Graduation rate not going to increase. You know our student base is going to get bigger, but we're going to have less graduates. I mean, it's not that's not you know us dividing and, and sending up a policy and giving these statistics. It is the government who is telling us, you know, this is what we expect the way things are going to go. So, <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about NIEA's accomplishments for the past year. On the legislative front, NIEA, along with National Congress of American Indians (NCAI) in the United South and Eastern Tribes, USET, helped draft provisions which would later become known as the Native Class Act. The Native Class Act, which is also known as the Native Culture, Language, and Student Success Act, is a bill passed out of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs late last year. It certainly developed culturally based curriculum and assessments and supported schools and programs that use native languages as a primary instrument of instruction. It authorizes the increase of tribal control over the education of Indian students. It establishes teacher development programs to recruit native teachers and ensure culturally aligned instructions. NIA continues to advocate for the provisions of the Native Class Act and all its communication and education activities on the Capitol Hill. NIA worked with other national partners representing African American, Latino, and Asian communities. NIA particip participated with the campaign for high school equity to reduce student dropout rates, to increase the number of effective teachers, and to increase college career readiness for Native students. On the executive front, NIA assisted in planning and implementation of the National Tribal Leaders Consultations on the State of Indian Education and advocated for public release of the United States Department of Education's report entitled Tribal Leaders Speak, State of Indian Education 2010. This report highlighted concerns from tribal leaders nationwide on issues such as inadequacy of federal education funding, the need for increased availability of native language and culturally based education, the need for more tribal control of education systems responsible for education of our native students, and the need for increased recruitment and retention of native teachers. NIA supported the creation of the pres presidential executive order to increase the visibility and attention devoted to American Indian and Alaskan Native education within all federal agencies. This executive order mandated all federal agencies created plans to assure that the education needs of American Indian and Alaskan Natives are taken into account, that their Native languages, cultures, and tradition ways are honored and respected, and that the education progress of American Indian and Alaskan Native students will be tracked and report it from one year to the next. On the communications front, NIA has created innovative ways to increase our annual convention's visibility and impact. It was impacted by live webcasts of many of the key events of the convention this past year in 2011 at the Albuquerque Convention. NIA also partnered with Native America Calling to broadcast three of their daily radio programs from the convention. NIA has launched an improved website with research and policy updates and useful data which can be used by Indian education advocates. On the data and research front, NIA created a research division to capture and tell the stories of education success 
and our unmet education needs. NIEA has collected, analyzed, and distrib distributed research on the impact of native language and culture based approaches to promote native student engagement and education success. NIEA has disseminated native education research and best practices at the state and national conferences. NIEA has assisted, assisted the general public in using and interpreting data about native people in partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau, the Gates Foundation, regional comprehensive centers, and various state departments of education. NIA realizes that 2012 will be a very difficult year. The annual budget may reflect cuts, but we can fight for Native education. NIA must continue to work on both sides of the aisle. We must talk with both Republicans and Democrats for dr dramatic and lasting change in Native education. NIA must continually work towards a federal education policy that supports tri tribal self-sufficiency and self-determination while holding, on the, holding the federal government to the trust responsibility to Indian tribes. <clears throat> NIA will focus on five things. They will focus on strengthening tribal control of education. They will be addressing the needs of native education in urban settings. They'll be investing in cultural and language revitalization. They'll be developing and retaining native teachers, administrators, and education leaders. And lastly, improving the federal government's support of native education. NIA supports the strengthening of tribal control of education, which includes the funding of tribal education departments and possibly the tribal education agencies while mandating more collaboration and sharing of data from state and local education agencies, also known as SEAs and LEAs. NIEA supports addressing the needs of native education in urban settings. NIEA supports inclusion of urban native learners as education policies develop and resources are allocated at the federal, state, and local levels. You know, it's a uh, very difficult and complex issue sometimes if you look at the need to, to educate our urban Indians. But you know, if you know anything about our tribes, you know, we do not forget our, our people. We do not forget, you know, where they're at and what they're doing, and they're still a responsibility. Many tribes, even if they live in another state, they can still vote for their elected officials. So they are still citizens of the tribal nation. And so we must build that bridge between our tribes and the urban Indian students. We must help educate those urban Indian students. Uh, many times, urban Indian students, they look to going home, to look to their tribes for their identity. You know, they're searching for it. And so <clears throat> I don't know where tribes and some of the urban uh, entities got into where it was conflict. And someone said it was because of the Health Indian Centers that was being funded some years ago. But there should not be any conflict. You know, Indian, this, the whole United States is Indian country. There's not a place on this continent that wasn't and didn't have a tribal nation as its home site. Think about that. There was not a place in the United States in which some tribe historically had a land base considered their land. So if you consider that, you know, let's not be, you know, held to federal rules and regulations. Let's hold on to our traditions that our people, our, our, our generations to come after us are still, still are part, parts of our nation, even though there are some students who are multi-nations. And there's nothing wrong with that and learning you know, multiculturals from different tribal nations. I think that's great. But how are they going to do that? You know, what tribes have the capacity to, you know, provide information, much less even a course to a tribal student who lives outside the area, maybe clear across the country? I mean, that's the need that's going to happen. We have tribal leadership here. Tribal leadership. Raise your hand if you're a tribal elected leader here, please. Wow. That's, I, I, I just need a couple of them. Those students who are out there are going to become adults. How do they know, where do they go to to learn about tribal government? How, where do they go to to learn about where, how your government works? You know, how's that going to happen? How's it going to be, are, are you going to be able to bring them in and give them instruction? Are you going to be able to go to that school system and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Osage, 
I have an Osage student. They need to know Osage history, government, you know, language, et cetera. How are you going to do that? So that needs to be bridged. You know, we need to work for that. Our population is not coming back to the reservations. We all know that. It's being expanded. It's being out there. It's being greater. It, the, the complex situations are growing. And you, we're not growing with it. We're not meeting the needs of our Indian students. So let's not forget our ur urban Indian students. NIA supports the investment in culture and language revi revitalization. Let me tell you, uh, I worked in some language programs. I'm, I'm not fluent. I know some Cheyenne words. You know, my mother was a boarding school student. You know, Cheyenne was her first language. But let me tell you, our efforts, our efforts in most tribes to, to retain our languages is not very good. You know, it's not very good. You know, let's, let's use education to, to help solve this issue. Education cannot do it alone. It takes more than one entity, more, more than one funded program, more than one high school course to, to save our languages. You know, if you take a whole cadre of courses in your tribal language, it doesn't mean you're going to be fluent. So, you know, let's, let's step up the effort. Let's use education to bring that together. NIEA supports the developing and retaining of native teachers, administrators, and education leaders. It is critically important to increase the number of native educators working in the education field. This effort would include more resources for professional development, salary increases, and other long-term employment. NIEA supports the improvement of federal government's support of native education without significant costs. The federal government could take several important steps to improve its support of Native education. Today, President Obama will release his proposed federal budget for FY 2013. As an overall matter, we know that he plans to stay within the budget limit set by Congress last summer. This means that he has to offer a budget that is little less than 1% of the FY 2012 budget. We will soon learn today what this means for Indian education programs. However, his budget will not reflect the plan cuts that the law provides for by January 2013. Unless Congress amends the law, we, we will see cuts of uh, from 8.5 to 9 percent in virtually all domestic programs, including Indian education programs. The federal government has a trust obligation to Native peoples, which is based on treaties, agreements, and the giving up of traditional lands. Native American cultures and communities flourish on this continent. However, in recent centuries, our ability to educate our children has been under assault. The federal government historically has displayed a keen understanding of the central importance of our ancient ways, beliefs, cultures, and languages to tribal unity and strength, and for years made every effort to destroy this, if not support this. The effort to kill our minds and our spirits has failed, but not without first doing great damage. Indian language are, languages are in retreat. Native students perform far below the, their potential. Federal paternalism has encouraged poor self-esteem in many of our tribal youth. The Native spirit has endured and in recent years grown stronger. Much of the harm inf inflicted upon our Native peoples is being undone by Native people themselves, and yet the resources needed to complete the great task can only be found with the originator of the harm, which is the federal government. In closing, Native education is growing, and it is growing stronger every year. It is, it is uh, getting stronger by the many activities that are occurring in, in, in the country. You know, some of these we know about, some of these we don't know about. There's some exciting things, the projects are being done, initiatives are being, being initiated or given to, to whatever you know, services or however activities are being done. You know, Indian country is taking it upon themselves to provide many great things, but we need the support by the, of the federal government. Even in states, they are making efforts to improve Indian education. To mention a couple of the states, in Washington state, they are creating successful partnerships with Indian tribes by, censor, by ensuring that they meet on a government-to-government -government basis. Washington is committed to working closely, the state of Washington is committed to working closely with tribes and tribal organizations. In Oklahoma, the State Department of Education has recently filled their Indian education position, which is, which is almost non-existent. The gentleman is Dwight Pickering, a, a good friend of many of the Oklahoma educators. This person is directly working with the recently created Indian Education Advisory Council. 
Uh, I wanted to add in here that, you know, the councils are great, but for years we have also had partner advocates. We've had the Wisconsin Indian Education Association as a partner. It was brought out in our meeting yesterday. We have the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education, who is the host for the next year's convention. So we have many partners out there, and NIA helps to improve that partnership. Positive relationships between federal state, excuse me, federal government, state governments, and tribal governments are necessary for the future success of our Native students. It was pointed out yesterday in our meeting, and <clears throat> think about this, uh, education of our public school students, you know, where does the money come from? The average is 10% of it only comes from the federal government. 90% of it is local and state money. Now, of course, those students who are low performing, they get, probably get more money. If they have a lot of Indian students, they probably get more impact aid money. But think about that. You know, that's $1 out of every $10 is federal government. So really, the, the majority of the money comes from state and local revenue. So that's why tribes need to make those partnerships. We need to strive to get those partnerships that's going to help our Indian students. Now is the time for us to choose education that is excellent and is based on our traditions, and especially important in an age in which the success of our communities, our tribal nations, the preservation of our languages will be based on what we know and how we use the technologies of the future. Let us help every Native community choose a high-quality, high culturally-based education. Let us join together to take control of our schools to ensure the future of our children. And let us work to ensure that the federal government meets this trust responsibility to us all. Before, before I give you the final statement, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I had a conversation with, with Dave Olio about the Indian education back then. It started as Title IV. If you've been in Indian education through the Title IV program, you know five, seven, four, nine, and there's several titles. If you've been around that long, you know that it's gone through. Let me tell you, the, the unspoken hero of Indian education is the Title VII J Johnson O'Malley education staff. You know, if, if you compare what they do to other federal programs, they do a lot more. You know, certainly they meet the requirements of the grant. But I can tell you, if, if you know a Title VII Indian educator, more than likely, they, they go beyond their, their required duties. You know, they stay after school. You know, they, they wake students up, take them to ACT. They go knock on the door, get them out of bed, take them to school. You know, all these things and many other things. They, they look for opportunities for their students. They get them involved in summer programs. So these are Indian educators who work for Title VII and Johnson O'Malley programs. Those are really the unsung heroes. Who, who here works for Johnson O'Malley or Title VII? Raise your hand. I can guarantee you, you look at their job description as to what they're supposed to be doing, and what they actually do is, is a lot different. So I want to thank all those unspoken un, un, uh, heroes who've been around who do that work. So let's give them a hand. And this is what some of you have been waiting for right here. Thank you for joining together to advocate for our children. Thank you for being part of NIA. God bless America. Thank you.